Yo, what's up everyone? It's Josh Tonga here, and I'm so pumped up for today's guest. His name is William Buhlman, and William Buhlman has over 40 years of extensive personal out-of-body experiences, and he conducts workshops with the Monroe Institute and has appeared on numerous television and radio shows worldwide. He's also written the books Adventures Beyond the Body, The Secret of the Soul, Adventures in the Afterlife, and Higher Self Now. So William, it's good to have you on the show, man. Oh, it's a pl pleasure to be here, Joshua. Awesome, awesome. You know, so we're continuing our series on out-of-body experiences. And, you know, as I mentioned with my last interview with Graham Nichols, I just want to help shed some light on this subject and hopefully clear up a lot of the misconceptions that are out there. So, you know, let's just get started with definitions first, William, you know, because I've heard it defined in different ways. I'm just curious, how would you define an out-of-body experience? Well, it's the experience of your conscious awareness being uh, outside of your physical body. Okay, so it's your conscious awareness outside. I mean, would would you also go along the lines of like some sort of energy body going outside of your physical body or would you not? Oh, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to keep it as simple as possible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, uh, your consciousness uh, would, of course, when it exits, it's using an energy body, a non-physical energy body, because uh, we are all multidimensional beings. And uh, during an OBE, we transfer our awareness to a non-physical aspect of ourselves that we already possess. Yo, cool, cool, yeah. Um, now, let me ask the following question. As I do with a lot of the first timers on the show, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, what was your life and your beliefs like before your first OBE? Well, uh, that goes way back into the 70s. I was uh, in college and I was pretty much what you would consider an agnostic. Um, even though I was brought up as um, a Lutheran Christian, um, I started to doubt a lot of the beliefs that were part of that, but I was searching for answers. I always was a person that wanted to know the answers, and I was not finding them in the established religions. Uh, so a friend of mine had an out-of-body experience spontaneously, which, by the way, is very common, and um, it changed his life. It opened him up to a whole new reality, of a whole new way of perception, a whole new vision of himself, and I was, he explained it to me, and he, I, I knew this person from childhood, so I know he wasn't lying to me, but it was new to me, and I began to explore it, and I found that there were techniques that you could practice to self-initiate, and uh, what today is called an out-of-body experience, and I, I wanted to have the same experience that my friend had, essentially. I, I, I was searching for answers. And I did not believe necessarily in an afterlife, but he proved it to himself when he had an out-of-body experience. So that, that was one of my first goals, is that I wanted to prove that there wasn't, that we continue beyond the body. That was my goal. Um, and back in, seven, in the early 70s, after about 24 days of practice, I had my first fully conscious out-of-body experience. And it was Life-changing, totally life-changing, because then suddenly I had some answers, some verifiable personal answers, and it changed the way I looked at myself, and I became, um, for lack of a better word, really uh, almost obsessed with this idea of discovering more answers through this process of exploring uh, non-physical reality through out-of-body adventures. Yeah, yeah, well, let's kind of explore that for a minute then, because like, you know, as you actually mentioned in your book, you said that, you know, after your first OBE, you said that all your agnostic beliefs were pretty much swept away in a single night. So, like, what what happened in your first OBE, you know, and then what beliefs actually changed? Well, I, I had got to the point, again, it's a belief system um, that, that it, everything, I was um, a real believer in science and hardcore facts and all that. While I was in college, I'm a young, keep in mind, I'm in my, you know, early 20s. Uh, and um, and when my, during the, my OBEs, I realized, oh my God, not only can, are there other dimensions all around us, but there's people. I, my first experience, I, when I left my body, um, I not only, it was such a mind-blowing experience because 
not only did I realize that I left my body, but I realized there was someone watching me in the room. The, for lack of a better word, it felt, it felt like or appeared like the walls of my little uh, room had melted. And behind one of those walls was a man that was observing me. And at first, it was quite startling, and it shocked me. Um, and I immediately um, snapped back to my body. It was a brief experience, really, but very vivid and very memorable. And it, that's what opened up the whole new world of, oh, my God, there's another dimension here, at least one other dimension, and people live there. And uh, that's what really got my, um, changed my whole thinking on the nature of reality and the nature of myself. And I began to explore it heavily uh, for, well, for now 40 years. Right, right. So, I mean, with that experience, um, would you say that it was like very, was it crystal clear or was it kind of hazy? Or? Oh, crystal, crystal, crystal clear, clear as real as anything in the physical world. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't. Matter of fact, uh, I didn't go into all the details, but at the onset of this, I was laying, I was doing my technique, which is the target technique, which I still teach today, uh, where I visualize um, uh, three targets in my mother's home. And um, I was laying on my side and I was facing the wall. And what made me aware of the fact that I was out of body is that I reached out my arm and my arm entered the wall. And I could feel the energy substance of it. And that's what awoke in me immediately the fact, oh, my God, I did it. I did it. And I thought <laughs> of standing. Yeah. And that's when I was standing by the foot of the bed. I mean, it was very, very 100% real, not a dream. And, of course, that's been verified a thousand times since that. <laughs> no, no I, I could totally relate. Um, because I just remember some of my early OBEs, and when I put my hand through the wall, I was like, "Oh my gosh!" <laughs> you know, so I, I was tripping out, and just like you, I was I was hooked, and um, and it was also clear as well. But you know, there's always going to be skeptics, and and even if we were to say, uh, you know, that it was an out of body experience, you're still going to have some skeptics say, "But how do you know? You know, it's not a dream because you know hands don't usually go through walls." You know what I mean? So, like, what, how sure. would you respond no, I, to something like Look, that? I'm all for skepticism. I'm a great skeptic. I wouldn't have believed this. I, I can tell you this definitively. I would be the last person on the planet that believed that we could leave our bodies back in the 70s. I was a science fanatic. I didn't believe any of this non-physical stuff. I had no knowledge of metaphysics. I was clueless about all this, so I had a big learning curve because it opened me up to this realization that we live in a multi-dimensional universe and the physical world is just the epidermis layer. And I don't care what people call it. You can call it heaven. You can call it, give it all kinds of names. But there is a vast universe that is just waiting for us to explore. But we have to take the initiative and become explorers of it. And otherwise, uh, you're living in denial and uh, in a very limited manner. Uh, if you, if for, for those of, out there that think that the physical world is the center of reality, you find out very quickly through these experiences that the physical world is just a tiny fraction, a sliver of this huge continuum of non-physical realities that are present all around us. So it's a real eye opener and it's it's a wonderful experience because then begin to waken up to the true nature of yourself and the true nature of reality. Yeah, so maybe, you know, you could kind of unpack that. I mean, you mentioned that we live in a multidimensional universe. So maybe this is this question is kind of related to that. You know, how would you explain OBEs where people end up in like a like a familiar environment, like their bedroom, you know, and then they notice that there are some differences though in their bedroom, like their walls are a different color, uh, or there's an object that's usually there is actually missing this time. You know, what, yes. what's going on there? Well, it's, um, I explored this now. My, it was my first five years of my experiences in the 70s. I explored, it's, most people today call it the etheric level. It's, it's a parallel world. Some people call it the parallel world. It's a substructure of matter, essentially, is how I view it. 
And yes, it's 99% almost identical to matter. Most people that leave their bodies enter into this first, call it the first sheath of this vast universe we dwell in. And it's, um, it's, it's almost identical to matter. That's how, when I teach, as you know, I teach OBEs um, in self-induction at the Monroe Institute. And I always tell my students that if you're in an environment where your immediate surroundings are similar or almost identical, you know you're in your densest energy body and you're in the densest non-physical realm that exists parallel with the physical. And it's, that's what that is. It's a substructure. It's part of the, and you know, science has confirmed this. Matter cannot exist, hang in space by itself. It needs a substructure. And this multidimensional continuum acts as this, as a substructure and the support mechanism. But when we leave our bodies and we enter into this, this realm, which is a very limited realm, actually, we, uh, uh, but most people don't go beyond that, unfortunately, because they, they, they feel comfortable in that environment. But as you probably know, when you expand and raise your vibrations, you begin to enter another vibratory realm, and all of that dissolves away, or you, as you raise your vibrational rate and your consciousness, you begin to enter into other dimensional spaces that are no longer similar to matter. So that is the, uh, the densest non-physical realm that is closest to matter. And it exists with this here and now. It's not up or down. I want to make this clear. Mm -hmm. It exists. It coexists with us all around us. Now, pretty much. Right now. <laughs> okay. You know, so I mean, if, if that's true, if there's like these parallel dimensions, I mean, so I guess we could assume that there are other parallels and other versions of us too. Well, we are currently operating multiple energy bodies as we speak because the physical is the end result of a chain of energy events of consciousness. Okay. In other words, currently people, unfortunately, um, many people observe, uh, or even, even religious people, they have a tendency, uh, for instance, the early Christians essentially created three dimensions, heaven, earth, and hell. That's a three-dimensional model they created. The Catholics added a fourth with purgatory. But what are they really doing? They're talking about four separate dimensions here, are they not? Sure. These are four spaces existing. Uh, so this idea of a multidimensional reality is not as strange. Uh, religious believers all believe in a multidimensional reality. They just have different names and they frame it differently. That's all ex us as explorers have done as begin to explore it firsthand and to realize that it's it's not it's not three or four dimensions. There's many many dimensions, and we exist in all of them as a different energy body, because we need. In other words, a physical body, the soul exists at a much higher vibratory level, and the energy of soul is stepped down through multiple energy bodies into the physical. To be able to function and to examine, to explore every dimensional reality, you need an energy body in that reality. Just like you need a physical body to interact in physical matter, you need an etheric body to interact in the, in the etheric dimension. You need an astral body to interact and communicate in the astral dimension. I'm trying to make this as clear as possible. So as such, you know, we are in, we exist in all of these dimensions right now. Okay. I mean, so have you seen yourself in another dimension? I've Yes, I've experienced myself in many different dimensions. Um, in, for instance, think of it if, I don't want to get too, too far ahead here, but what I and others have observed is that time does not exist when you leave your body. There's no biological aging. People don't think about this. Non-physical reality has different rules in physical there is no air. Those people that have died don't have lungs. They don't have physical eyes. They don't have physical ears. You're operating in a whole different um, space. In other words, there's all new set of rules. 
There's no biological aging because you don't have a biological body. There is no time as we observe time in a linear fashion. But in other words, we have to begin to look at the universe in a whole different manner because we are non-physical beings temporarily visiting this, this and using a biological form, a very limited biological form for a very limited space and time. But as soul, we're immortal. So we have to begin to look at the universe and ourselves in a whole different way. And by the way, I'd like to add, how else are we ever going to have the answers to these questions of who we are, what we are, where we come from, and where we're going, if we don't go and explore our true self? Right. Knowledge sure. of self is the reason why out-of-body experiences are so incredibly powerful because it gives you that glimpse of your true self, of yourself beyond the body, your con the self that continues beyond the temporary facade of this life. In other words, OBEs are spiritual experiences. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that that's a good point because it's kind of something, something that I point out often when I have uh, conversations about this topic is like, as I mentioned before the interview, um, I was raised as a Christian. I grew up like that. I, I I believed in it wholeheartedly, honestly. So it wasn't just something I was raised in. I actually believed in it, um, a lot of the doctrines back then. But I remember uh, just sitting in a church and uh, listening to pastor after pastor talk about heaven and talk about hell, and even myself being guilty about talking about heaven and, and studying it from a book called the Bible where we studied the Greek and the Hebrew and all those things. And yet we talk about something called the afterlife, but yet, Many of us haven't even been there, <laughs> you know, to have direct, you know, firsthand experiential knowledge, you know, and that's yeah. what I've seen, why I appreciate your books, you know, just kind of reminding me. And it's something that I tell a lot of people in general is like, find out the truth for yourself or we're just being spoon fed all these things. But what if they're not true? <laughs> you know, exactly. but this is something that we well, could you, say, people, I know. What, what people, I, I, I'm with you. I was brought up as a Lutheran Christian. And um, I, I was spoon-fed a lot of beliefs, but let's let's face the hardcore truth here. What would you and I have believed if we were to be born in Iran right, or right. Iraq mm -hmm. or almost or in China? We would have we would have had no religion. My point is that uh, every culture and society is spoon-fed a bunch of man-made belief systems. We existed way earlier millions of years potentially before any of the religions existed. And, and the only way you're ever going to know the truth of yourself is to experience your true self, which exists beyond the temporary facade. Right, right. And it exists within us, right? As I, I think I've even yeah. heard you mention in other interviews about out-of-body experiences are ultimately about going within. Yes, it's always about moving in within. An out-of-body experience is actually a very poor term. What we're actually doing is transferring our conscious awareness inwardly to a non-physical aspect of ourself that already exists. And then people begin to exterior what's commonly referred to as exteriorizing. But it's always an inward journey. Everything is inward we're already existing in the outermost dimensional space in the universe. Yeah. So yeah. that's the power of not only out of body experiences, but the same thing applies to meditation. Uh, that's why for, for let's see, half the population of the world practice different forms of inner exploration through meditation, because it's another way of connecting with that aspect of ourselves that is immortal. In other words, the answers are not on the outside. The answers are on the inside. Right. And it's up to us to have the courage and the open-mindedness to explore that inner part of ourselves. Yeah. And I think that's a whole other, I guess you could say, framework for a lot of people, uh, including myself back then, you know, because it would sound, it's it's not the language that we would use back in the day in my, my religious upbringing about looking within. It's usually about uh, reading the truth found in a book <laughs> called the Bible, you know, because that would be the ultimate standard um, for what we were taught, you know, and that looking within, 
you know, or looking into your heart or whatever, those would be considered uh, unreliable because we're considered uh, like wicked, you know, and deceitful and all. It just a, has a very skewed uh, view of, of the self. But anyways, you know, just going back to what you were talking about um, concerning like these multi multi-dimensional universes and stuff. Um, you often talk about in your books about that there are certain environments that are more thought responsive, you know. So what, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, as we move inward, the physical world is the least, it's the slower to respond to thought. It's still thought responsive, but it's a very slow process because of density. As we move inward into uh, the etheric and especially into the astral, um, in other words, the environments become more and more subtle. They're not, matter doesn't exist when you leave your body. It's just everything is a thought form. Everything. Never, actually, everything in the physical world is a result of a thought form. And think of it. It takes multiple people. When a building goes up, it's a matter of architects. Many minds are involved in shaping our reality. And then it slowly comes into form. But if you go out of your body, you realize very quickly that all form are thought forms. Just They're like crystallized thought in the physical. But once you're out of body, you realize very quickly that the environment is much more responsive to your thoughts. And you begin to realize that you have the ability to shape and mold your reality very quickly. And of course, this is a double-edged sword for people. If you take your fears into a thought-responsive environment, your fears can manifest. If you take love into a thought-responsive environment, that will manifest. The universe it doesn't, we're not being micromanaged. We have the free will to project. Every thought, every emotion is a projection that we're putting out into the universe. The universe doesn't edit those. There's no, it's we have, we have to learn self-control and the ability to become mature explorers in non-physical realms. And this is, this is what heaven is, essentially. It's a collective of individuals who all have shared the same beliefs. I call it a, I call it a consensus reality. There's millions, from what I can tell, from my 40 years of exploration, there's millions of heavens. And they're a collective of different belief systems. For instance, believers in ISIS are not going to be hanging out in the same heavenly, let's call it heaven. It's a non-physical reality, but for the sake of argument, let's call all these realities heavens. Uh, an ISIS member is not going to have the same beliefs and thought patterns and consensus beliefs as, let's say, a Hebrew would. And so they would, have, they would create their own individual realities or heavens based upon the collective group. A collective thought is very powerful and it molds reality very quickly in subtle non-physical realities. And that's how these heavens have been created and evolved. And there's countless, all kinds of realities based on the, the collective of individuals. That in other words, those of like mind have a tendency to, to be together because they reinforce each other's beliefs. The same is true in the physical, if you notice. Right. And this, it just continues, except it happens much faster because non-physical reality in the afterlife is very much a subtle construct. And it's molded by, it could be millions of people that share the same beliefs. In other words, there are Christian heavens. And they're shared by those of like mind of, of different segments of Christianity. Sure. Like, then there's churches and stuff too, right? Oh, yes. I've observed churches in the afterlife. I've, yeah. I've observed mosques and synagogues and everything you can imagine exists because a collective of individuals have created them. And they, as long as they believe it, they maintain that reality. And these realities are quite nice. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm, they're all, these realities can be very nice. Most of them are much nicer than the physical because there's no death, there's no disease, there's no wars. So, of course, the word heaven is a perfect word for it. Compared to the 
the trials and tribulations in the physical world, all of these non-physical realities could be, I guess, in by people's terminology, could be called heavens. Right, right. But it's all relative. It's all because there's other realities beyond these. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just to stay on that whole consensus reality deal, so if someone were to say, does a Christian heaven and hell exist? In, in a sense, you would say yes, then. Yes, because okay. they've made it. They've created it. God right. didn't create it. They made it. Mm -hmm. They made it as a collective. Mm -hmm. Just like there's places on earth that are heavenly, and there's places on earth that are hellish. The same applies, the same rules in that regard apply here, because it's the collective consciousness of the individuals that are creating the hellish environments that are, we find today in wars. Let's face it, there is, I've, I've lived in Asia for four years, I've lived all over the world, and there's many places in the world right now that are, are, could be considered hellish right, right. in every aspect. Right. Because uh, you don't know where your next meal is coming from. People are starving. People can be killed at any moment. Uh, there's no, no clean water. You follow me? Yeah, yeah. And the same applies in the non-physical. If you believe in hell, if you feel guilty and feel like you need to be punished, you would, you would actually be, um, uh, uh, you could easily create your own hell. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, unlike um, the Christian tradition, at least in some more conservative evangelical traditions, uh, you know, hell is supposedly it's eternal. So in your understanding with these consensus realities, people can create these hells for themselves, not necessarily because it's a judgment from God, but they project it themselves because of these you know, uh, deeply yeah. rooted beliefs that they have. But um, would the difference be, it, it would be in this sense, though, they would, it wouldn't necessarily be eternal. It's just because they're able to still change their beliefs about hell if they choose to and, and continue Absolutely. to evolve, right? There's nothing, everything is changing. There's one thing that I have found in my 40 years of exploration of non-physical realities is that everything is in flux. Every, and it's all about your state of consciousness. We have to remember, we take nothing with us into the afterlife. That's all we are taking with us is our state of consciousness. Good, bad, or indifferent. That state of consciousness will mold your reality. And each individual is growing and evolving at their own rate. Since we're all immortal, it doesn't matter if it takes somebody a million years to evolve into a higher state of consciousness. Because that is their choice. But no, there is no eternal anything. Nothing is a, nothing that I have seen. Everything is in change. Everything is in flux. I'm talking about in the lower vibrational. Sure, what sure. we would consider the worlds of form. I'm not speaking in other realities where things are formless. I'm speaking where the heavens that most people will experience after death in their current life. They're not going to some eternal rest. They're going to a temporary respite, possibly, and they're joining their loved ones, as all the researchers of near-death experiences have related. Millions of people now have had near-death experiences uh, all around the world. There's hundreds of books written about this. And what do they all say? They're reunited with loved ones. And then, but that doesn't mean that's the end of the story. Yes, initially there were they people are reunited if they choose to be with loved ones. But then they make decisions in these non-physical realities about how they're going to grow, how they're going to expand their consciousness, how they're going to uh, evolve beyond that, that consensus reality. No one is limited. There's no one limiting anyone. We limit ourselves by our own, let's just call it, limiting beliefs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know that's a good point and that's something that i really want to um you know get our listeners to really think about this whole idea of consciousness kind of continuing you know after this physical life so to speak like for example like i know there's a lot of religious people who think that you know if their personality is a certain way or their attitude is a certain way on this life once they die and they cross over everything's going to be okay 
from now on where like all their problems are gone because they're in heaven now and you know absent with the body present with the lord etc cetera, etc cetera. but from what yeah. i gather from a lot of my research concerning you know the afterlife is that consciousness continues the way we are now which is why it's so important for us to kind of wake up to you know the truths of reality to evolve to a higher state of consciousness so to speak when it comes to service and love and you get what i'm saying yeah, absolutely this idea that everybody is cleansed at death is a total falsehood yeah i find no evidence of that we continue the ignorant continue to be ignorant yeah <laughs> the bigots continue to be bigots right i mean yeah. it, it's i, I it's it's natural part of our evolution because we're taking our entire state of consciousness with us and our beliefs and our prejudices. Everything goes with us. There is no there is no cleansing done. That's all part of the effort. It's up to each of us to evolve ourselves. And that's one of the things, at least in Buddhism, they, they understand that. That that's why it's so important that you work on yourselves now. Right. And not just mouth it, not just going to church once a week and speaking some words is not necessarily self-evolution. <laughs> right, right. It's really not. Right. I'm talking about di deep diving within yourself and really studying your own psyche and your own mindset and your own beliefs and finding out um, why do you believe what you believe? Do you have any evidence supporting what you believe? You know, these are important questions. Yeah. You know, the average human has no idea where they come from and where they're going and what their purpose is. It's sad. It's a sad state of affairs. And they enter the afterlife with that same lack of knowledge. And they, what do they do? They end up in another collective of believers that resonate with them and reinforce their own beliefs. The problem is that all man-made beliefs, and if I may, this is what I have found. Um, all man-made beliefs are flawed. They're made by flawed people. I don't care how inspired people say, every holy book ever written, is, the word has been used inspired. I don't doubt that they're, they were inspired. The point is they were still filtered through the mind of, flawed human beings in a cultural context. Right, we have right. to remember that. Sure. And we have to decide, how can I, dis how can I obtain the, the truth for myself? Because God gave us the ability, and this is an important point, God gave us, we have the natural God-given ability to obtain the answers for ourselves. We're not sheep. And by doing so, through let's just call it through inner exploration of consciousness, whether it be meditation or out-of-body experiences, we have the ability to begin to obtain the answers and experience our true self beyond this temporary facade and know the answers. No one limits us. It's our own beliefs that limit us. So, I mean, if these are things that you, as you said, it's like a God-given thing for us to be able to to evolve and to experience and learn the truth for ourselves but to the, as a typical or as i've heard at least in my own circle you know many christians would say that that this practice that you're encouraging is unbiblical quote unquote and demonic so how would you respond to that oh i had a silliness the bible's <laughs> full of out-of-body experiences right uh, look at uh the the beginning of revelation begins with, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. What? The, we have to remember the cultural context. What does I was in the spirit mean? Does that mean he was in his physical body? Of course not. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And then he goes on to describe this, this magnificent experience he had in non-physical reality. Revelation is a non-physical experience related through the eyes and the experience of a someone 2,000 years ago in their cultural context. We have to always put that into, the Bible is full of these statements of I was in the spirit. Jesus was asked in, in I forget what, but it may have been Matthew, about whether he was a prophet, of an, a past prophet of the Old Testament. Why would he be asked that? You know, there's so many parts. 
the Bible, what made these people, Jesus and other of these great disciples of the Bible, they were explorers of consciousness. They, they, they had non-physical experiences. And they shared them to the best of their ability in the cultural context of 2,000 years ago. The Bible is full of non-physical adventures, of angels. And everything, but we have to we have to look at it through that context of the cultural and context of that era, and of the religious context, because all of the disciples were Hebrew. I mean, they were all framing their experiences based on their own backgrounds and their own beliefs. But the Bible is full of adventures of consciousness, where people are adventuring into non-physical reality. Yeah. The same applies to uh, all of the holy texts throughout in different religions. Right, right. And that's why, you know, I just find so funny from people who, you know, would criticize this stuff as uh, not being from God and demonic when the Bible itself has a lot of those experiences, as you mentioned, that there's a, if people just read the Bible closely, they'll notice that there's a lot of strange experiences that go on in the Bible, as you said, of people being in the spirit, people going to the third heaven and out of the body and you know, taken up in the spirit, et cetera, et cetera. But, but people, it's weird, but it's like they separate that world from us here that it's okay back then, but for anyone who experiences those things now, it's, it's wrong. I, yeah. I, it's, it's, it's silliness. St. Paul uh, clearly states in Corinthians, I was in the third heaven. Yeah. He doesn't say heaven. He says third heaven. Yeah. I mean, imagine that. In other words, he's ref his, in other words, he's saying there's multiple dimensions of heaven. Right. Right, right there is a clear statement mm. of of this multidimensional nature. These prophets were having multidimensional experiences. All of them. I'm not just talking about Christian prophets. I'm talking about the Buddha, uh, Muhammad. You go back and study any of these prophets of of the ages, and you will find they were all having essentially out of body experiences, exploring a multi dimensional, non physical realities, and then they were framing it based on their own cultural context. And to think of this as demonic is silly, because that then <laughs> what are you saying? And then Jesus was demonic, and <laughs> right, right. Paul was demonic. These people were all having. Whoever wrote Revelations was definitely out of his body. Right. These these were these were experiences that inspired people that had the courage to go out there and explore. We're having, and uh, um, I think it's it's so closed minded to just put a label on these things uh, because that's where the answers are found. I, I really know this for a fact. And by the way, I've been having out-of-body experiences for 40 years. I have never in any way, shape, or form had any kind of demon or demonic experiences. Hmm. I mean, never. I, my experiences have been loving, wonderful. I've contacted and communicated with my dead mother and my dead uncle and had wonderful, loving experiences and gained immense degrees of knowledge about myself and the universe which is difficult to share in this limited space. Right. But that's, you know, think of it. We have, we're on this planet for what? One reason, to experience. We learn through personal experiences. I use this statement that I as a male, you and I as males could read a thousand books on what it's like to be a woman. But we would never know what it's like to be a woman until you incarnate as a woman. We are that learns through becoming what that which we wish to learn we become it that's how we grow and learn as soul and it's it's a long-term plan we are learning and growing exponentially we're all immortal all of us there's no hell we're all continuing and it's a wonderful magnificent reality we're all entering now, if you create challenges for yourself, of course you're going to create a result. Cause and effect still applies. Energy cause and effect. So there's, if you want to call it hell, 
people create their own hellish environment by, by let's just say, choices they make sometimes. But it's all energy. It's all expressed. Yeah, you, you kind of answered this already, but I guess just to clarify, you know, because you, you mentioned that you had no um, OBEs yourself with no, you know, no demonic activity or whatever, you know, no. me too. I, I never had any of those in all my experiences as well, but there are people who do have yes. some demonic. Yes, so. and there's near death. You know, th this is interesting. You know why I haven't? Because I don't believe in it. Right. <laughs> no, it's that, true. It's simple. I, I, <laughs> after 40 years, I, everybody always asks me that. Because I don't believe in hell. I don't believe in <laughs> demons. I don't believe in devils. I don't believe in that, that childish uh, fear-based control mechanism that was created. I, I know it's a falsehood. Now, I do know that my thoughts, if I project negative thoughts, I can create a negative event, a challenging event. But I know better than that because I know that I, in a non-physical thought-responsive realm, I'm the creative force. You know, it's interesting. Depending on what you believe, near-death experiences, most of them are very loving. But there's some people... And what's weird is that they're almost always Christians. Right. <laughs> they, they can have hellish experiences. Yeah. You know why? Yeah. Because they believe in hell. Yeah. That, and it's, there's a correlation there. Totally. Many people don't believe, like myself, don't even believe in the concept of it. And uh, so it's not on my radar. It's not in my state of consciousness. I believe in a loving, supportive universe. Because I know from experience that's what we're in. Yes, the physical world is challenging, but the, the goal is the evolution of consciousness. That's the goal of all of us being here. It's a slow slog, but it's the, the goal is the evolution of consciousness through personal experience. Right, right. So, I mean, with these experiences of OBEs and, and having our beliefs in play where, let's just say we have healthy or you know more positive beliefs in us you can say that you know these self-initiated obes are are safe then for the most part yeah yes yeah. but you have to realize you're taking your state of consciousness right. into your experience right and as such if you harbor fear-based um uh, serious fear-based beliefs in demons and devils and you take that belief system into a non-physical reality you may experience that yeah. kind of event right. because you are the creative force behind it. It doesn't mean it's an objective reality. I'll tell you the truth. This has been proven time and time again also when people are on hallucinogens or uh, when people do ceremony, you'd use an ayahuasca, and you hear about people in ceremony having negative experiences because they're taking their fears with them. If you enter into any thought responsive realm with a predisposed fear based mindset, you have there is a possibility that you are, and I'm, I like to emphasize, you are the creative force in non physical reality. You, that's part of the lessons we're learning that we are the creative force in our own personal space. And you take your fear based beliefs, you're going to manifest God knows what. If you take loving beliefs, into your non-physical reality, you will create loving experiences. We have, this has been, for 40 years, we know this to be true. Tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people know this from personal experiences. I would say millions of people by the day know this to be absolutely the truth. That's why we have to work on ourselves. So we, we, we grow up and begin to realize that we are influenced by our own state of consciousness. We're not, we are the creative force. We are the ones that are entering each non-physical reality. And we are, each thought is a projection. I have to remember that. Every thought is a projection. Every emotion is a projection when you leave your body and in the afterlife. Yeah. 
No, you know, that that's one of, it's a good point because like when people ask me if it's safe, you know, cuz they get scared when this conversation comes up, some people get uncomfortable. When I bring up this stuff, they actually <laughs> find it scary, you know, and they would ask me like, "Josh, do you think it's safe, you know, for me to try this stuff?" I said, "Well, it actually depends." <laughs> you know, so if it depends yes, on the it person. Yeah, depends on your own state of consciousness. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Well, unfortunately, we live in a society inundated with fear-based beliefs. Right. The movies, the media, the culture, the religions, they're all saturated with this negative fear-based belief systems. We have to break free from that limited mindset. It's all about controlling us. How do you best control people? It's through fear. Exactly. That's where... My feeling is if it's fear-based, I reject it because I know it to be a total lie. And there's always an agenda. Look behind the belief to the agenda. I'm not just talking about religions, but I'm talking about all beliefs. Generally, they, there's an agenda behind, behind them. And it's generally control. No, it's totally. I mean, that's <laughs> that's what gets people to do what you want them to do is by using fear, you know. And and, and I've seen it. Um, you know, just even I, I would watch some even uh, NDE stories or out of body experience stories on YouTube of people who are so like immersed in this topic of coming out of the body, but yet their context is like a fear based Christianity, you know. So I remember even watching this one video of this this kid. I don't know if he's a kid, looks young, but he was even just asking. God, you know, is, is hell real? And he was watching all these and you know out of body experiences of people going to hell and you know demons and et cetera, et cetera, and fire. And then next thing you know, when he goes to bed one night, he has some sort of experience that's completely hellish. And God was like a jerk, <laughs> you know. But it's like yeah, it, it's so as if it was shaped and projected by his inner psyche. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, I can tell you this. I've been teaching. I, I'm the OBE trainer at the Monroe Institute. And I've been teaching out-of-body, self-initiated out-of-body exploration, which is the exploration of consciousness now for over 20 years. My first book was published 21 years ago, over 21 years ago. And I teach people how the, one of the first things you have to train people is to begin to dissect and really take a hard look at their beliefs. You have to start at the very base of your state of consciousness to develop your state of consciousness is to purge yourself of all the falsehoods and when we 99 percent of everything we've been taught from birth is flawed or false I, and this goes for a lot of things not just religions sure. i'm talking about everything even the fact that we're one of the things i learned and let, let me throw this out there the whole basis of human civilization is that we're bipedal humans, physical humans, is it not? Over, what, six and a half billion people believe that we're physical humans, but yet when you leave your body and extend your, let's just say, your stay in non-physical reality, your humanoid form begins to dissolve away and you quickly discover that we, as consciousness, are not humanoids. We are just a point of consciousness. Bob Monroe talks about this. Many authors who have explored this extensively. Now, people don't have this experience in the first few years. of the. I, I had this experience only after about 20 years of having OBEs. And what's amazing, the deep meditators and yoga practitioners that have been practicing these inner journeys say the same thing. We become points of consciousness with 360 degree. That's what soul is. Soul is not a human form. Soul is pure consciousness with the incredible power, creative ability to create the form and let's just call it method of locomotion and perception needed to learn and evolve in every dimensional space. We're incredible beings. We're much more than any of us have been led to believe. It's exciting. And we're just beginning to evolve. And we really are. We're just beginning to awaken to the true nature of what and who we really are and our capabilities. 
it's an exciting journey that we're all on. Yeah. I mean, I, I just got to ask, because you, you kind of mentioned it in passing about, you know, what are your thoughts, though, on people who use drugs to kind of induce these experiences or try to, you know, attain enlightenment? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I'm against all, I'm against drug use in general, and this is why. I'm a, I matter of fact, I'm very staunch against all drug use. And this is the reason why. The one thing that we possess, the only thing we have of value, the only possession that's of any use to us, not only in the afterlife, but when you have an out-of-body experience, is your own state of consciousness. It's the only thing you are taking with you into these non-physical thought-responsive realms. The last thing you want is for that not to be 100% clear in your perception capabilities. Sure. It's critically important that we remain totally clear, totally, totally clear in our non-physical states. That's why I am so against the use of any kind of drug-induced states. And I know there's a lot of people using ayahuasca, yeah. DMT products. I know this. Yeah. I've been teaching this long enough to know. I have students <laughs> yeah. that, that use it. And I, you know, everybody has free will, but I personally feel strongly you have to be able to have total confidence in your perception capabilities. And when you take an altered state, when you enter into these states altered, you are you no longer can trust your perceptions in non-physical reality. Mm. There's a question mark there, and that destroys the the viability and legitimacy of your experience. That's why I believe in non-drug right. usage. Right, and it also kind of um, substitutes, you know, the whole part of a person trying to do the work to you know, evolve um, instead of just having like a quick fix, like a quick feeling, you know, um, of just using drugs. And, you know, just people who have conversations with me about this topic, like, you know, they, they would be interested in just, you know, wanting to have some sort of experiences and stuff. But I'm like, well, what if you just trained your mind, you know, and just learn to know that you, you could do it naturally, you know, through meditation yeah. instead of here's this. this. Yeah, people are looking for a shortcut all the time. I know that from my from my experience, for sure, but for that's sure. individual call. I, n I never support it or endorse it um, because I think that's part of the problem in our society today. People are not willing to do the inner work. There, it's it's easier. I'll be quite frank. It's easier to go to church once a week and sit and listen to somebody uh, basically give you a sermon. It's tough every day to meditate. To have that willpower and that determination, that takes that that is that's hard work for people. And it's the easy way out is to sit in a list of somebody talking to you once a week and then feel good about yourself. Right. <laughs> but the hard work is done daily. Yeah. Whether it be through meditation or whatever method you choose to go inward. That's where the work is done. But people today are always looking for the easy way. And one of the easiest ways is just to believe in some pre-made belief system and then surround yourself with a bunch of other people that believe the same thing. And that's easy. That's the easy way out. I, I hate to say it, but it's the truth. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. You know, and so it, it, like you, you even had that experience of having this OBE, like you could have tried taking drugs the first time, but it took you 24 days. <laughs> you, had, you had to put in the it work, did. right? And, and you know, I tell you, not, not many people have that kind of uh, patience and determination. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. I, I do that from teaching OBEs um, how to induce them. And I tell people, this is not, this takes, it's like... But it's no different than meditation. Nobody sits down to meditate and expects to be the Buddha in two weeks. <laughs> right, but right. yet, when they do OBE practice, a lot of people give up in two weeks. Right, right. They say, oh, nothing's happening. Well, what inner exploration has, gives you instant gratification, generally? There is none. Meditation is a long, it's a lifetime commitment for people. Yeah. So, I, I mean, if, if there are, you know, if it does take work, to do it right it, take, it takes a half an hour a day commitment right to just do your exercise that's all it's not i'm not talking about going into a cave and <laughs> being crazy and 
being, you know, not eating. And, you know, a lot of people in India go through quite extremes to initiate altered states and profound experiences. I'm, I'm not suggesting, I'm just suggesting we, we designate a half an hour a day and do techniques that are proven to work, but it takes repetition because your subconscious mind has to be conditioned for a new, uh, let's just say, mode of perception and capabilities. That's what we're doing. We're conditioning the mind to, let's just say, open and to have experiences beyond this uh, temporary facade. Right, right. Or just awareness of, of reality, right? I mean, yeah. like, I mean, so if there is this work, in a sense, of, of trying to reach these different states of consciousness, you know, what, what are some of the benefits that you can mention to having OBEs, other than the fact that, you know, there's a non-physical reality or something. Like, what are some other oh, benefits that you could... Total, oh, there's so many of them. I list 24 in my first book, Adventures Beyond the Body. 24 distinct advantages. The big one is a complete fear of death is gone. You realize instantly that, oh my God, I continue. <laughs> I have just proved to myself. You know, that's the biggest lingering fear in, in, in all of humanity is the fear of death. For sure. It yeah. is. There's no bigger fear than that. That you can. That's the beauty of it. You can prove to yourself. You don't have to believe. There's. I like to emphasize one thing. There's no belief systems in out of body exploration. Each individual has their own experiences, and they come to their own conclusions. Nobody's telling you what to believe. Everybody has their own little take on it. Actually, depending on your state of consciousness and the realities that you have perceived. But as far as benefits, oh, my God, there are so many. Yeah. I mean, the self-knowledge, the greatest threat to humanity is a lack of knowledge of self. That's why there's wars. If everybody on the planet had an out-of-body experience, nobody would want to kill another person. You'd realize you're interconnected. Or everything would be changed instantly if every human had an out-of-body experience, a profound out-of-body experience. Nobody would go out trying to start a war or kill another person or rob someone because you understand immediately, oh my God, I'm just, I'm hurting an aspect of myself because I'm interconnected. Right, right. It would be a huge paradigm shift for the entire humanity. I mean... Anyway, I list 24 benefits. Yeah, I'm sure yeah, there's a lot. I mean, you said that there's like the fear of death is gone. You know, I mean, there's a set, I mean, there's a, the, the reality of the fact that, hey, life, life goes on, <laughs> you know, yeah, after I death. Continue. That's a big deal. <laughs> we all continue. There is no, you have to, in other words, if we all continue, that means that maybe there isn't the death. You don't escape the actions of this life just because you die. Right. Because right. you don't die. Yeah. Yeah. So it brings up a whole new, what, what in the East they call it karma. I just call it cause and effect. Sure, sure. Yeah. But it makes you responsible. That's one thing I found. Yeah. People that have OBEs become very self-responsible. Yeah. They know that every thought, every deed has an impact that carries forth. Right, right. They don't, you, the last thing you want to do is harm another person. Right, that's huge, you know, because I, there are people, you know, I'll be asking people even on Facebook about, like, what their thoughts are about life after death, and a lot of them are always about, it's just all about the now. I don't think about life after death. It's about living life now. I'm like, well, I get that. In a sense, you're trying to be present, but there are consequences to what we do if life continues on with this whole idea of law of cause and effect. You know what I mean? So, I mean, even if yes. someone on this plane of reality this physical reality were to forgive you for something stupid that you did um there could still possibly be consequences to what you've done and you know quote unquote the next life so to speak you know and i think that that's what a lot of people are just not really aware of when because they're not really thinking about these things you know about the afterlife which is why i'm trying to introduce these concepts to my audience because a lot of this stuff is new to people in even in the christian world Believe it or not, like just like as you mentioned, it's just very limited to just heaven, hell, and purgatory. You know, purgatory if you're Catholic, you know. And so, um, but there's just so many different concepts and stuff that I think people I want to kind of put on the table and let them start to think about, like, oh my gosh, if life continues, and we're not just going to be completely sanctified and glorified in heaven or whatever, 
and our, if our consciousness continues the way we are now, then it really matters with what we do now, you know, about how much we will awaken to, you know, love, you know, and to the service yeah. of other people, you know. And I think another yes. benefit, as you, you kind of mentioned it earlier too, is um, you said you saw your, your mother and your uncle. And I remember reading that story about where you saw your uncle Hilton, I believe that was his name, yeah. you know. So can you kind of tell us what happened and like how do you know it was really him? Oh, that was no doubt. Um, I, that was early on, actually. I, I had an out-of-body experience. I was in my mother's home. And for me, this was a pivotal event. This is the first time I experienced a non-physical person that I knew. And my uncle was quite obese when he died at a relatively young age. And we were very, we were pretty close. I mean, he was, uh, he lived right down the street from me. And uh, he called me Willie, which I hated to be called Willie all throughout. <laughs> you know, that's, I just hated that. So anyway, I have an out-of-body experience in my mother's home. And, um, and I start to just, I'm walking out to the front. I always go to the front door. I always head to the front door because there's no limits. You can fly, you can right. do whatever you want. But anyway, I'm walking to the front door. And then oh, to my right, I hear somebody calling my, this name, Willie. <laughs> And there is, of all, I instantly, even though he was no, he was young, he was thin. And he's sitting there, but I knew it was him, Willie. And he starts asking me, how can you do this? He's asking me how I'm having out-of-body experiences. And my uncle starts quizzing me on how I'm able to have, to explore out of my body. This is in the early 70s. It was definitely him. And to make a long story short, it was a pivotal moment because I knew it was him, even though it didn't. Remember, you don't have eyes and ears in non-physical reality. Not physical. You, 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 cre you create the facsimile. But there's no biological eyes and ears. There's no biological body. So we have to remember that. You perceive with your mind. But what I perceived, my uncle was a thin, younger man, like in his prime. I would say in his probably um, mid-20s, mm -hmm. and, um, and he, he was continuing anyway to make a long story short, that struck me. So when I finally come back to my body, I talked to my mother, and she had a scrapbook. Uncle Hilton was, of course, the brother of my mother, and she brings out these pictures of Uncle Hilton when he was in the service in World War II, mm. and it looked just like <laughs> he did in World nice. War II. Nice. In his prime, you know, as a young man in yeah. his 20s. Yeah. And it was mind-blowing. That was my first experience with what I would later realize is that, you know, the dimensions are not, they're no up and down. Everybody, non-physical dimensions are all right here. They're just vibrating at a much higher frequency. They're less dense, so we can't perceive them. But they're right all the dimensions exist here and now. They're just different varying degrees of density. So that was a mind blowing for me because then I realized, oh my God, I'm not only, you know, I could communicate with non-physical inhabitants. And um, what was even more interesting was that he was asking me for advice. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I just wanted to highlight that story. I found it because th that's a huge thing when, when we really think about this life. Because, you know, when I do speak to people who are materialists, you know, or they just don't believe in some sort of afterlife beyond the grave, it's like they just say, hey, we have one life and I'm happy with this life. You know, that after I, I die, I'm just going to go in the grave. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's great for you because you maybe you have a good life. But what about those who had short lives, you know, or those yeah. who didn't have good lives and they grew up in poverty? Yeah, what about all the babies that exactly. are born and only live for uh, three minutes, exactly. four minutes, an hour? Right. Every day there's, uh, there's hundreds and thousands of babies that are born that are die yeah. within the first day of life right. all over the world. Right. I lived in China for four years. Right. And it was quite prevalent in China. Hmm. Um. My point is, do you think that's wasted? Do you think that soul just goes to, to heaven and stays there? No, that was, that was some evolutionary plan. There's more to, there's a lot bigger picture at work here. 
all of us are playing a multi-dimensional game of chess, but the average person is only aware of two levels, the physical and the non-physical. That's all, and they give it the term of heaven. But that's not the game we're actually playing. We're playing a vast multi-dimensional game into infinity, in immortality. And we're limiting ourselves by these belief systems that structure us into this very, very narrow perception of ourselves and reality. The answers are up to us to obtain through our own personal exploration. And like I would always say to your listeners, don't believe me. Find out for yourself. Right, right. Believe a word I just said in this broadcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. Don't believe me. Find out what the... I have free techniques on my website, astralinfo.org. I have my entire techniques chapter there. You don't have to buy a thing. I'm not trying to sell anything. I don't, I don't want to sell anything. Go to my website, get the free information, and then commit 30 days to exploring this yourself. And then you reach your own decision on it. I appreciate that. You know, Do you mind uh, just sharing just one technique that you found to be really effective for you? Well, I have many techniques that are very effective. Um, one of them that I do and many people do uh, that is probably the easiest technique is as you're falling asleep, you just repeat an affirmation and you hold that affirmation as your last conscious thought. Now, this may not be the most, um, I teach, as you know, uh, 30 techniques in my week-long class. People do 24 different techniques. Each of them is 50 minutes long. Yeah, yeah. The easiest ones that people can do is just to create, it's like a mantra, a re repetition of word, um, like OBE now, now I'm out of body, or whatever word that you feel resonates with you, OBE now is popular, and you saturate your mind and your beingness with that and hold it as your last conscious thought as you're falling asleep. That's one of the easiest techniques. But I, and like I said, anybody that goes to my website, um, there's over 20 techniques on my website that you can, they can download for free um, and read them and see which one resonates with you. Everybody, um, you know, there's motion techniques, there's visualization techniques. Different techniques seem to work for different people. That's why in my classes I have people doing multiple techniques. Because people respond to different um, stimulus. Sure. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, because, uh, you know, I've tried several of your techniques and they've worked for me. <laughs> I've tried different, you know, different ones. And um, I think that's what's so kind of funny is that everyone wants to know what's like the technique. I'm like, well, it depends. You know, some techniques work better for other people. So, uh, you know, yeah. just check out, you know, your website, right? Was it astralinfo.org? Yes, astralinfo.org. Yeah, and just before we close, um, you know, what, what, what are some closing thoughts you, you'd want to give to our listeners before we end, or any advice? Uh, that we have the ability to obtain the answers for ourselves, but to do so, we, it's essential that we become explorers of consciousness. Not believers, but explorers, active explorers. In other words, don't believe in the words of Jesus. Become like Jesus and Buddha and St. Paul, and St. John, become explorers. Don't just believe in the words of a man. Become the man, whether whatever that belief may be, and, and practice a technique and follow through, whatever it is that resonates with you, whether it be meditation or out-of-body experiences. But find a method that you can do, and then... It, Know in your heart that you have the ability to obtain the answers for yourself. Good advice. Good advice. Cool, cool. So, so what's next for you? What's going on with you these days? Uh, well, I'm doing my workshops at the Monroe Institute. I'm, I just signed up for um, five more next year in 2018. Oh, okay, nice. I do um, um, my OB intensive there, and I do Destination Higher Self, which is a preparation for the afterlife workshop. And that's get, that's all on your website. Yes, it's all on my website. Okay, cool, cool. So your your website's astralinfo.org. You're also on on Facebook and on Twitter. 
So well, you know, I'm not on Twitter. Oh, I'm you're not, not active. On uh, okay, account. you're not. I, yeah. I have an account, but I never <laughs> there. It's all good, but you you do respond to the messages that where people contact you on Astral Info, though, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, I, I try to. Oh, I get a lot to. of. I try <laughs> to as best I can. Sure. I sure. get a lot of. Um, let's just say mail. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Um, because the book, my books are in twelve languages. Nice, nice. Cool, cool. So you guys, be sure to check out William's William's books, Adventures Beyond the Body. And his latest one is Higher Self Now. And he has other ones on Amazon.com. If you like listening to audiobooks, remember I teamed up with Audible.com. So if you want to download just any one of his books for free, uh, there's a free trial that you can do. Just check it out at audibletrial.com slash flipsite. Um, and if you like this show, you want to help keep it going, just go to patreon.com slash Joshua Tungle. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. And if you got just two minutes, folks, just spare two minutes, just write a review on iTunes because it'll help more people discover the show. And of course, please share this interview with your friends. And so, William, thanks for being on the show, man. I really enjoyed it. And I really think uh, our listeners are going to enjoy it as well. Oh, well, thank you. For sure. You know, Alrighty, guys, once again, thanks for listening. And I'll catch you guys on the flip side. I'm out. Peace.